Exactly. Very exciting, Raja. Let's hear now from uh, Dr. Kurt Costello. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, the ISS program chief scientist. And it's really exciting to come down here for these launches to see all the hard work that goes into putting together a payload mission uh, for the International Space Station science, pulling that all together. And as, as Bob and Raja here are great representatives, one of our most critical resources on the space station are the crew members themselves. Doing research with the crew members in, in relation to human research, trying to understand the risks to our crew members as we continue out farther into the solar system, that is uh, of paramount importance for us. But the crew will not only be doing human research, they'll be helping out with some biology research, some physical science research, and uh, even doing some groundbreaking EVA research. We've never done uh, really a, an EVA like this one coming up. Back to you, Jasmine. Lots of exciting science going up on this mission, Kurt. Now we're gonna hear from Dana Atcherson, the Deputy Program Manager for NASA's Commercial Crew Program. Hey, welcome, and I'm um, very excited to be here. As um, she said, I'm Dana Hutcherson, Deputy Program Manager for Commercial Crew Program. I've been working with Commercial Crew Program for um, almost 12 years now, and this is just one of our exciting moments, getting ready and preparing for this mission. Um, we're getting ready for our sixth rotational mission of taking um, astronauts to the National Space Station from U.S. soil, and it's our seventh crewed flight. So this is really a cool opportunity for us, and um, as uh, Colonel Cabana said, we're also very excited to um, also bring on board very closely behind that Boeing, the Starliner on CST-100 and uh, getting that uh, crewed flight test up here in, um, in the springtime. So it's a very exciting time for us. And I can tell you, we talked to the crew this morning. They're doing really well. They're excited to get ready for this six month mission. Um, the vehicle's doing well as well. We're, um, the teams are off now preparing the doing the last final things and checkouts that they need to do to get ready for the, for the mission. And actually our engineers and scientists are back behind today working on checking all of the boxes, making sure everything is ready to go. They're in boards right now, just doing the final checks. We'll have some review, a couple more reviews as we head into the launch on early Monday morning. So very excited to be here and a good time for us to be here at Kennedy Space Center. Thanks so much, Dana. It's nice to hear that we're looking good for Monday. And last but certainly not least, we have Patrick O'Neill from the ISS National Laboratory. Patrick. Well, thanks, Jasmine. And uh, first and foremost, uh, for those of you who are not from Florida, welcome to Florida. I uh, hope that we have a, a fun smoke and fire in a couple of days, but uh, very excited to go out there and uh, spend some time with you all. One of the questions I like to ask when I have a chance to meet with this type of a group is, prior to coming out here, who knew that the space station was a national laboratory? So most of the time, yeah, it's like 50-50-ish or so. And, and so it's an opportunity for us to you know, provide some education on what a national lab in space actually does. And so I'm excited to go out and talk with you about some of the science that we help to support and sponsor, how we work in partnership with NASA, and how it is that we're all able to collectively utilize the space station to bring value to humanity and drive business models in low Earth orbit. Thanks, Jasmine. Of course, and thank you all for those opening remarks. That brings us to the fun part of today's panel, the question and answer. As I said at the beginning, we have a lot of content creators here in the room today. So if you would like to ask a question, please raise your hand and we have a microphone that will get to you. You can introduce yourself and please say who you would like to answer your question. Uh, if you're watching online, please join the conversation using hashtag AskNASA. All right, so let's get it started. Well, hi, thanks for being here. My name is Mike Verkest, and for uh, about 28 years or so, I've been involved in emergency medical services. I'm a paramedic and in the fire service. And I wanted to speak to, and I'm not sure who would be best to answer, uh, maybe the Colonel, maybe Raj, but um, we, we've started employing checklists for our high acuity, low occurrence procedures, things like that. And um, I find it interesting that pilots, anyone in aviation, they use checklists for everything. So maybe you could just speak to a little bit about human factors, why checklists are important, why people should uh, trust those checklists and use them and not pretend like they, they know all the stuff. Thank you. I'm going to start if you don't mind, Mike, and then Rosh can chime in. But one of the things that it's come out of, uh, of flying, actually, is crew resource management, and it's transferred over into uh, emergency operating rooms. Uh, there was a problem in aviation for a while where you had these very senior captains, and you'd have a, a junior uh, co-captain pilot, uh, co-pilot on board that the crew would not question the captain because he was so senior. 
and uh, even when there's something going wrong and learning how to work together as a team is crucial. And that's how we train for our place, space flights also. I'm going to let Raj go into that. But checklists are critical. Um, you know, the really important stuff you memorize, but you always get the checklist out and do it right. And I had a rule when I flew. Raj can talk about his, but we always had like a two man rule where I had somebody with the checklist verifying when I, my checklist that I actually had my hand on the right switch and we were doing the right thing so that we did everything in the proper order. One of the real problems that you can run into is when you have a break in your habit patterns where you're going through a checklist and something interrupts you. And it's really critical that you make sure that you go in at the same point that you left off and you don't leave something out or it can have really severe consequences down the road. Raj, you want to add to that? Yeah, absolutely. So I think you're exactly right. So you mentioned like some critical things. So there's a, a handful of things and then the Air Force, we call it bold face. Uh, some places call that critical action. Item. So there may be a handful of things you do an immediate button push or something like that. And the, and the dragon would be like hitting the fire response button. That would be like an immediate thing. But everything beyond that, the system is so complicated. And really, especially on the space station, you are working with such a myriad of systems, payloads, people, the ground. You really don't want us not using a checklist. You want, uh, it is so complicated, you can very quickly make the situation worse. And there's very, very few emergencies that would be benefit from you rushing. And so if nothing else, we have a saying in the Air Force, of like turn the clock. So the first thing to do in an emergency is like, hack a clock, do something just to kind of have a two or three second, let that sort of like the lizard brain part of your body that wants to react and do something stupid, just take a breath, think for a second, and then and then go. And the checklist helps with that. And exactly like Colonel Cabana said, we, we either verify you with the ground, with another crewmate, uh, pretty much every step. And it just adds uh, a layer of, you know, it, um, a layer of certainty to it and to make sure that you don't wind up in a bad path, especially uh, when the, the space station models, we are, we are the eyes and ears and doers, but the ground has way more insight into the overall system. And so it's, if you're not in sync with the ground, it's really easy to go down, a, you know, we, whether maybe you're coming up an eclipse or, you know, the solar panels are at some different angle and you don't know all that information without following the checklist and talking to the ground. Bob uh, Raja, thank you for answering that question. Next here in the room, We've got some hands in the back row there. Hi, yes, uh, Kyle Shea. I'm from Tulsa Community College. I have a question for uh, Dr. Kurt Costella here. You mentioned in your intro that you are doing some groundbreaking EVA research on ISS with this next mission. Can you elaborate on that? Sure. Um, the the research investigation I was mentioning is called ISS External Microorganisms. And it's a question that was raised by the researchers here at, at Johnson Space Center as to what is the survivability of bacteria and fungi that we all carry with us as humans. Uh, no matter how clean we try, try and be, as humans, we're going to carry around uh, these things. Think of it as your own little pig pen. Uh, <laughs> you're, you're bringing these things along and Obviously, when uh, air and other items are vented from a spacecraft, they're exposing that population to space. So we want to know if it's survivable, um, if it manages to reproduce outside. Uh, we're going to be taking samples using an EVA swab tool at several locations around the airlock, and we'll also be doing two control samples outside, just exposing them to the vacuum of space. And we really want to know this for planetary protection measures. We want to know as we go to the moon, and not so much on the moon because it's, it's really harsh there, but on Mars, where our primary goal, one of them, is to search for how life might have developed there. We want to know that we're checking for life that developed there and not life that we brought along with us. So this is an exciting study. It's the first time we've done sampling of the space station externally on the U.S. side, and we're hoping to learn a lot from it. Thank you so much, Dr. Costello. I see some hands back here in the room as well. Uh, Commander Cabana and uh, Astronaut Chari, thank you very much. Uh, my name's Jim Reed. Uh, you might recognize a call sign, N4BFR. I'm part of Amateur Radio on the International Space Station team. And I want to thank you very much for your support of Colonel Cabana, SARX, and Astronaut Chari, uh, the ARIS program when you were up. <clears throat> Can you talk a little bit about how your experience with Amateur Radio and NASA going together, as well as, I don't know if you're aware, but the 40th anniversary of ham radio contact from human spaceflight is coming up at the end of the year, and any thoughts on that as well? 
Well, I'll go first, KC5HBV. Uh, now, I, I think what it did on the shuttle, it, it allows us to reach a, a group of students of uh, folks on the ground. It, it just generates interest in science and engineering. And, you know, when you go along with what is required for to build a radio, to operate a radio and communicate with somebody in space, that's really cool. And to be able to reach down to students uh, from space and be able to share with them over shortwave radio, I thought it was really a fun thing to do. Yeah, I enjoy it. I think it's a, you mentioned it's kind of a capstone project for for students and it's a, it's a cool thing to actually do with the project so you're not just building a radio or you know going through the mechanics of it you actually get to use it at the end and then to talk to the space station was is pretty awesome um i got to talk to some japanese students uh and it was it, yeah it was definitely a highlight we actually act uh, we used it in one of our sims as well because if you lose space to ground loops and the russian comm system you can actually use the ham radio um so that's a it is a tertiary a quadruciary backup if you if you will and you have to then convince the person on the ground that you're not hoaxing them like no kidding this is the iss go call someone uh, call, call houston um but uh yeah so it's got a it's got a practical side too other than the educational part thanks for asking Jim. yeah thank you both for those answers uh any more questions in the room i see some hands over here in this corner Hi, my name is Jen Cotton. I was a science teacher here in Brevard County. So I just want to tell you all, thank you for sending student projects up on this mission and making those dreams come true for those kids. I know as a child, being a science nerd, that is something that would have been amazing. Um, I have something for our scientists up here in ISS. Um, how do you manage project from conception of a question to data collection and analysis when you're rotating out staff? And as a chief scientist on an, a traditional expedition, you're going to be the one on the ship or on the facility working it. How does that work? Well, I, I think that was for me. And I'll say <laughs> I, I have not gotten to go on an expedition yet. It, it would be most enjoyable to do so. But um, uh, no, that's, that's a great question. The way NASA works is we have a number of science sponsors. Uh, from within the agency and also through our ISS National Laboratory partner, we've got other government agencies, um, commercial entities that want to fly science to ISS. So it's a, it's a really big problem because you have to integrate across all of these different agencies, different divisions within the agency that all have, uh, you know, they start with a hypothesis and uh, then, then a scientist uh, gets selected uh, is given a grant or uh, is sometimes in the case of commercial paying their own way now. And they're coming forward with their project. Of course, most often they've never done research in microgravity before. They have no idea what it takes to get from their laboratory benchtop experiment that they're doing on the ground to the space station and to be able to operate that safely, uh, to be able to contain all the harmful um, uh, components potentially of that to be able to conform to the space station's electrical systems, data systems, things like that. And that's really where uh, the, the ISS program office comes in. We help them navigate all of those, those minefields along the way, get them packaged, get them prepped, uh, work with our folks at Marshall to get procedures for the crew to be able to operate uh, the payloads safely. And then all of that comes together in these wonderful missions, the expeditions that we have. And then even then, we're still not done. We've got samples that now need to come back down to the ground for analysis. So uh, there are a lot of folks on the logistics side that help us pack everything so we can get the absolute efficiency uh, out of the vehicles that we need. They return those samples and then the scientists finally have their samples for analysis. So it is a really big process. And again, there, there are many, many different sponsors for the space station. And I don't know if you wanted to add on the National Lab side. Yeah, I can, I can definitely add to that. Um, and, and actually, this it's a great question. And it also kind of got me thinking about the question you had about checklists. And so, you know, think about it from a standpoint, if you wanted to send this pen to the space station, you can't just send this thing up by itself. It has to go in flight certified hardware. There's a variety of companies, entities that can work alongside a research team uh, to be able to take this pen and say, okay, we're going to send this to the space station in this facility and it's going to do X, Y, and Z. So oftentimes, as Dr. Costello alluded to, uh, you might have an initial concept of what you want to do, but there are 
constraints on what it is that you have uh, the availability to leverage on the space station. So there's, again, NASA, there's ISS National Lab, there's other sponsors, there's companies that can all work alongside a research team to be able to take their, their thought and make it reality. So it really is a collaborate collaborative effort uh, from a lot of entities that all work in unison to, again, try to make this, this come to fruition. So, um, and you, you also alluded to uh, student investigations. Uh, from a national lab perspective, we actually put out a variety of research announcements that are focused specifically towards either education or workforce development. Um, so, and, and there's also a lot of programs we work with through the Student Spaceflight Experiments Program. There's going to be an investigation that's launching later this summer from uh, Genes in Space, which is as it sounds, you're going to be launching genetic experiments to the space station. So you really do open up uh, a wide array of opportunities for students to get involved, both from an engineering side of the house, as well as uh, from actually launching science itself and, and even having the opportunity to potentially publish some of those findings. Um, so and at the end of the day, I think that that's ultimately what we're looking for is uh, we're kind of dubbing this the decade of results on the space station. So uh, anytime we have the chance to talk about some of those results, we want to bring that out to the, to the community. Thanks so much, Kurt and Patrick. We've got some more in the back and then also in the front here. My name is James Briarton from Charlotte, North Carolina. My question is for Raj. You're a trained professional, but as a human being, I wonder what it's like dealing with the suspense waiting to find out who's going to fly Artemis 2, 3, and beyond. It's actually pretty easy. It was, I'd be happy for with anyone in the office to do it. I mean, I think the, the, the whole reason I applied again twice, I applied once and didn't make it in. The reason I applied again was is everyone in the office is awesome. Uh, so I would, yeah, I, I don't think it matters who it is. We'll all be excited and all fall in line to support that person and those people. Uh, I think, you know, we were actually talking, I was talking to some of the PA folks. I think the most common misconception about astronauts is that our job is to fly in space. Well, that is a job, but most of our job is not flying in space. You mentioned 28 years, which is the same number Tom Marshburn, who is my pilot on Crew 3, was in the office. And so out of 28 years in the office, he flew like 500 some days. But that that's a <laughs> when you look at the percentages, that's a small amount. But it's flying in space is awesome, don't get me wrong. But we love our day job. So whether it was helping with the commercial crew and working with Dana before I flew or helping with HLS and the Lunar Lander now, that is super exciting stuff. Uh, and so, yeah, I would love to get assigned to Artemis. Everyone would. But I'll, we also love our job. Thanks so much, Raja. Hi, uh, my name is Blake. I run a YouTube channel called uh, Professor Marbles. I do elementary science experiments, and I have a question from a fifth grade student. Um, it's for our astronaut friend. Uh, they want to know. <laughs> they want to know how does it feel when you come back? Is it fun or scary? Uh, so I thought it was awesome. Uh, so I thought it was way better than launch, and it's because you're deconditioned. Um, and so your brain uh, interprets, so the, the fluid in your ear canals is still moving when you're in space, but it, your brain kind of interprets it differently. So when you're coming back, even though the capsule is kind of just doing this through the air, it feels like someone's got you by the heel and just like, went, like winging you all over the place. So I will say that the bad side about being a fighter pilot is theme parks and amusement parks are pretty lame. So I had to like ride with my kids and it was like, okay, like this is boring. Um, and so that was the first time in a long time that I was like, this is awesome. I don't know what's going on. This, it, I like it. Um, so yes, it is very disorienting. It takes about 24 to 48 hours for that to go away. And then about a week to get like stability back. And then about a month for um, like kind of full functioning, if you will, and then potentially years for bone loss. So it's, it's different phases for what recovery you're talking about. Um, and I know uh, Kurt knows all about the human science we're doing, but as soon as we come back, there's things going into us. Anything coming out of us is getting collected because there's a whole lot of people interested in it. Oh, thank you so much for that answer, Raja. <laughs> all right, we got some more over here. Hi, I'm Sarah. Um, I'm from Philadelphia, but I actually live in Italy, so I flew all the way over here to see you guys. Um, I do have a question. Sorry, my voice is a little bit down. Um, it, do you ever get time to manually fly the Dragon spacecraft in orbit? Uh, well, so Dana can probably speak more to the like the setup of it. I'll say if everything goes correctly, then no, that's not that's not required. I'd say very much like all of our training at NASA or in the Department of Defense, we train 99% of our training is spent on the 1% thing that you hope never happens. Um, so, the, yes, if everything goes correctly. No, 
Uh, Dana can probably speak to like the demo too. did yeah. do some manual flying. Yeah, I would just say that, you know, one of the thing, requirements that we had is to have this backup capability should the should you need that contingency where we would need to to manually fly. But the hope is, is that it's all autonomous and that everything is um, working very smooth and operationally. Thank you both. We actually have one question that we want to take from Twitter real quick for uh, Dana. Uh, today is Introduce a Girl to Engineering Day, so that's a very um, important observance. Uh, what do you love about being an engineer? Oh, man, there's so many things. But, um, you know, it was kind of a dream of mine when I was young. Uh, I was always interested in science and math, and I'm sorry for the teachers that are out there, but I was not the best in the class. I was not the the top of the class, you know, I was always um, loving the space uh, or the science and math. Um, but I really got um, interested in, in engineering after talking to some other women leaders and women engineers, too. I had an assignment in high school to go and talk um, to some a professional interest that you have and talk to some pe people. I interviewed a couple of folks and three of them happened to be women engineers. And I decided pretty much that day that was what I wanted to go do. So I went to a um, a, a college or university nearby my hometown at um, Georgia Tech and decided coming out of there that I, I wanted to combine my love of engineering and how how things work and understanding like the science behind how things work and combine that with my love of space. And I ended up down here at Kennedy Space Center about 20 year, 22 years ago or so. Nice. Thank you so much, Dana. Back to the room. We have some here in the front. Hello, my name is John Nubian from New York City. A question for um, overall ISS and into the science. What is the most significant experiment to come out of the ISS since it's been in orbit? And for this uh, launch or this mission specifically, besides the EVA experiment, what other experiment is, uh, are you looking forward to getting the results from? That's a tough question to answer. Not, not because there isn't a lot of stuff that, that has been very exciting, but it's because of that. Uh, we've had over 3,500 investigations fly to the ISS, and some of them have been really important for developing not only benefits for NASA to, to continue our exploration mission, but to return benefits to the Earth. And some of the ones you might have heard about recently are some uh, protein crystallization experiments where we're looking at how to make infusions of a cancer drug, uh, Keytruda, um, which is normally given through infusion uh, by making the particles more standardized and smaller. Uh, we're trying to get to a method where you can give that uh, by injection instead of a clinical setting uh, that, that takes time and is considerably uh, more painful than an injection would be. So we're trying to really uh, use the benefits of the microgravity environment uh, to return benefits for people here on Earth. There's a great publication that we just put out last year. It's called The Benefits of, uh, for Humanity 2022. And this highlights a lot of those stories about our uh, research and how it returns benefits to the human uh, population. Now, we're doing uh, some other great research on, uh, on this increment. We've got an investigation going up called BRIC26. And BRIC stands for Biological Research in Canisters. So when you think about it, they're Petri dishes. But in these Petri dishes, we're, we're putting up a, a Bactillus subtilis um, uh, microorganism. And we're looking at it for some very, very fundamental reasons. We want to understand the, the process behind DNA supercoiling. And this is how DNAs uh, can really wind them, wind themselves up tightly and uh, more efficiently pack themselves within a cell structure. They can also uh, get negative uh, supercoiling where they expand and get harder to pack. So we're looking at the impact of microgravity on that feature so we can understand at a genetic level what's happening to uh, our DNA in spaceflight. Um, and that is probably one of the most profound things that we found uh, through years of spaceflight. It's that microgravity in and of itself impacts every li living organism on a cellular level. So it is doing things uh, the way we uh, uh, express genes changes, our transcriptomics change, and that changes the overall organism. Now, a lot of that, as evidence shows, is reversible, but some of it we need to understand if it is 
permanent, what, what that is doing to um, both our crew members and maybe their food sources. So a lot of the plant research that we do, there's an investigation called VEGO5, which is growing tomato plants, is really how do we supply our crew members with nutrients and are they as good as the earth grown nutrients and can we use it to supplement diet for long duration exploration? Patrick, wanna add anything from the national lab? Absolutely, so uh, you asked the perfect question because you basically, my entire cheat sheet is predicated on what it was that you just asked, so thank you very much. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so from a national lab perspective, there's going to be a lot of investigations that are flying over the next couple of months that the astronauts will be supporting. Um, you, you also asked, too, like, you know, what is one thing that really stands out? Uh, a very long tenured project that has been happening for, what, 15 years, I want to say, is the Alpha Medic Spectrometer, or AMS. So that's been going on for a very, very long period of time. So that's one example of a project that has a very long lifespan. Uh, but projects will be flying during this increment. Uh, anybody ever heard of tissue chips? Tissue chips. Oh, I see Rachel in the background. She was excited about that. All right. So tissue chips. Think of like a little thumb drive. Um, it mimics the human physiology. So you're basically having this little thumb drive where you can have human cells and tissues inside of them. And you're going to be like floating around and thinking that you're in a, a normal human body. And you're able to send this to the space station. What's unique about this is that previously we've not really had an opportunity to do a lot of human testing of cells and tissues. Um, the astronauts, obviously a lot of things are done uh, to ensure that their bodies are, are main, maintaining, but that's not something that's open to the general population to leverage for investigative purposes. So we are able to leverage these tissue chips by sending these human cells and tissues up so that that way we don't re we're not reliant upon model organisms or things of that nature. Uh, but you're able to get that one-to-one -one comparison factor and possibly test things like therapeutics uh, or, or ways to mitigate uh, elements like cardiac issues. So on this mission, we will be having multiple tissue chip investigations that are flying that are funded through one of the centers within the National Institutes of Health. Uh, we also have a variety of uh, investigations that will be funded by the National Science Foundation, looking at both tissue engineering as well as transport phenomena and physical sciences. Uh, so it really demonstrates kind of that diversification of R&D. Uh, Dr. Costello talked a little bit about some of the things that NASA is going to be focused on from an EVA perspective outside of the space station. Uh, but we will also be sending a lot of payloads that will be leveraging this external platforms on station where you will have extreme temperature variances, atomic oxygen spikes, radiation spikes. So you can truly put uh, a, you know, a, a material to the ultimate test and see how it reacts in that space environment and uh, hopefully extrapolate that, bring that down and create a better, stronger uh, product for, for us here on Earth. Um, and then one of the ones I think that it, to me personally, I think is almost kind of like the sci-fi esque is, uh, we have a, a biofabrication facility on the space station. So this is a, a, a bioprinter. And the thought is that maybe, uh, that microgravity environment could help to allow for us to print things like tissues and, 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 and uh, organs for, that can be transported from space to patients here on earth. Um, now that's way down the road and that's, you know, again, uh, an exciting opportunity for us, but it's that notion again, that this microgravity environment can really uh, open up avenues for experimentation that just can't be replicated in the same manner here on earth. And I think that that's, you know, a, a pretty quick little breakdown of some of the science that's gonna be flying from a national lab perspective. But again, it's gonna be a really action packed couple of months and uh, the astronauts are gonna be very busy. Kurt, Patrick, thank you so much for tag teaming that question. We do have one that we wanna take from Facebook right now. Uh, Shannon on Facebook wants to know, can you tell me more about Artemis? And I think Bob will start with you on that one. All right. So uh, as everybody knows, Artemis is the twin sister of Apollo. And uh, I think it's a very apt name for our next uh, venture off to the uh, lunar surface. Uh, and I think, you know, one of the most important things about the Artemis program is when you look back on Apollo in the 60s and 70s, it was a bunch of white military test pilots with some white scientists, male scientists thrown in at the end. And um, when I look at the first class of shuttle astronauts, if anybody asks me what's the m major thing the shuttle contributed to our space program, I tell them it brought diversity to America's space program because that first class had men, women, black, white, Asian, Hispanic. And we have continued to build on that. And this time when we go to the moon, everybody is going to be able to see themselves in the crews that go to the moon. And how inspirational is that going to be for young girls and uh, minorities when they can see that, hey, you know, I could do that. And I think that's going to be really important. So I think everybody knows Artemis One was uh, our uncrewed uh, demonstration. Uh, we went further from Earth than any 
human rated capsule has ever gone before. Uh, did that skip reentry, and we're analyzing all the data. Um, it's two years between Artemis one and Artemis two, and that's because of decisions that were made in the past. We have to get the avionics boxes out of Artemis one, disassemble it, test them out, and then install them in Artemis two uh, for its crewed flight to the moon. And then following, hopefully within a year after uh, that Artemis II launch with a crew to the moon on a test flight, testing out the Orion spacecraft uh, without landing on the moon, we will then land on the moon on the next flight and pick up a cadence after that. We'd like to fly once a year. But I think the, the neat thing about the Artemis program is we're not doing it like Apollo. It's not a two or three day camping trip on the moon. We're going back in a sustainable manner uh, for as long as weeks at a time. Uh, we're going to have pressurized uh, habitats on the moon, a pressurized rover. Um, you know, the gateway is going to be in orbit around the moon, allowing access anywhere on the lunar surface. We're going to the south pole of the moon as opposed to the equator. The equator is much easier to get to. Uh, but we want to go to the south pole because we believe there are tons of water ice there. And water is uh, hydrogen and oxygen. It's fuel and air to breathe. And we want to be able to use the resources on the moon as we explore the moon so we don't have to carry as much with us. So we, we have more up mass available for uh, other things. And the reason for going to the moon is eventually we want to go on to Mars, all right? And we're using the moon as a training ground to learn how to operate away from planet Earth on, for an extended period of time so that we're successful when we go on to Mars. Uh, I have to give our deputy administrator, Pam Melroy, credit for uh, our objective-based architecture that she has put in place. And we've gone out to industry, we've gone to our international partners, we've shared this, we've been working on this. Uh, Jim Free and the exploration uh, team we're down here at the Kennedy Space Center a few weeks ago with folks coming in to look at what, what are the objectives and then what are, what are the requirements to meet those objectives. So we're laying this out in a very methodical way so that it is, uh, you know, it, it sustains itself as it moves forward. So I, I think it's going to be absolutely uh, amazing to see us uh, return to the moon in a sustainable way and eventually go on, a, on to Mars, establishing that presence in our solar system beyond our home planet. But we are going to the moon sooner than that. And uh, I think many of you have heard of the CLIPS program, uh, commercial LEO, and, uh, or commercial uh, science going to the moon. But these are commercial landers that uh, through Space Act agreements, it was put out by the uh, Science Mission Directorate. And uh, hopefully uh, this year and within a few months, I don't know who's gonna be first, but we have intuitive machines uh, down in Houston and Astrobotics up in Pittsburgh are both sending commercial landers to the moon. And NASA didn't pay for this whole mission, all right? They have skin in the game also. And it's establishing this commercial exploration of the moon also. So you don't have to wait till uh, you know, 2024 for that next flight to the moon. We're gonna be sending landers to the moon here this year. And that's gonna be pretty cool too. Yeah, very exciting, Bob. Uh, does anybody wanna to add to that answer on, can you tell me about Artemis? Hey, you're gonna fly it. <laughs> well, so I, I guess my advice uh, to the parents is ask your kids about it. It's just like the same way you learn about dinosaurs. Ask your kids; they probably already know the answers to to things about Artemis. At least from when I go around to schools, they are all over it. Um, so the way I explain it to the adults who have to talk to the kids, though, is uh, there's a few different parts. There's to get to the moon, you need a rocket, right? We got the SLS, so we got that. Well, you need a capsule, so people have to go in and somewhere. That's the Orion. Uh, you need somewhere to stay and go up and down, so that's the gateway. And all those three things are being built. I mean, it's not a PowerPoint thing. Like there's heart, like metal here at KSC that is those things. Uh, and then the fourth is the HLS, the way to get from the lunar orbit down to the surface. And right now we have one contract with SpaceX and like Colonel Command said, there's other contracts ongoing. So that is the part. So the, it's not easy to go to the moon by any means. It's, it's hard. Um, but the tech is all there. It's just the time and the money and the national will to do it. And I mean, yeah, we are excited. We're ready to go, but, and we are going, um, it's pretty cool to see hardware getting built, tested. Um, the momentum is there. Um, so yeah, uh, if you've got more questions, ask your kids, I bet you they know. Yeah. Thank you so much, Raja. All right. We've got some more questions here in the front row. Hi, I'm Mario Puzo coming from Los Angeles, California. Um, I'm really curious, how is the sleep experience while you're out in space? And what are your dreams like? Is there anything special that you can share with us? 
You want to go first? Sure, I'll talk. Uh, so I think uh, the first uh, sensation to kind of work through, and it's a little bit different for everyone. Everyone sleeps a little bit, restrains themselves a little differently, but I'm sure you've all had that feeling when you start to fall asleep at night. And if your arm goes off the corner of the bed or something like that, and you like startle up, um, and you've probably all had the experience of being in a roller coaster and the feeling of your stomach coming up. So you have that, I mean, you are in free fall when you're in space. And so as soon as you close your eyes, you snap back awake because your body is telling you you're falling. So it's really hard for your brain to ignore that because if you're in, if you were to be falling, like walking forward and falling, you couldn't fall asleep while you're falling. It's just, your brain won't allow that to happen. You'll wake up before you hit the ground. So it takes different people, different times, but for me about two ish days to actually get over that feeling and be able to close my eyes and not have my brain kick yourself back awake. Um, in terms of dreams, I don't honestly remember any significant changes, but I do, I do distinctly remember both on the way up and the way down. The first time on the way up, uh, so on, uh, on orbit, I think it was like three or four weeks in, was the first time I had a dream where I was floating in the dream. And that next day was the first time that uh, as, much as, as much as you know you can use the walls and the ceiling and space, you'll always reorient your body for conversations and to talk to work in the way that it looks like on the ground because the laptops and the equipment is, is oriented a certain direction. But after that time, it didn't matter. And I could come around a corner. It didn't matter. It, it was, and all of a sudden, like you notice little things. So like the first few weeks, the ground is always asked like, uh, did you, you know, did you power off that payload? And that's their gentle way of saying, Hey idiot, you like kicked it with your foot because we're just like tearing through ethernet cables and bumping into things. Um, but after that, after that three weeks, once that clicked, it was like, Oh, everything makes sense. And you just notice, like just floating through, you just see something just like you can now in your house, like right away, you're like, that's out of place. Um, and that was when I had that dream on the way on, after I landed the first time I was, um, I got up in the middle of the night, like that was like 10 hours after we landed. And even though the chair was on the ground, I could not convince myself. This was dark in the room. We're in crew quarters that I was not standing on the wall. Like I actually had to have my wife, like come like, like help me get off the ground because I couldn't, I was convinced I was going to fall over because I was on the wall. Obviously I was not in the wall. I was the chair. I was doing this with the chair, but I, I couldn't connect. And then about the first good sleep I had that wasn't ambient induced after landing, I had a dream where I was talking to people in the PMM and they were floating, but I was standing on the ground in the PMM. And when I woke up from that, everything was fine, like totally back to normal. So it's amazing what your brain does. And we talk about, you're like a baby in space. You can't eat on your own. You can't poop or pee on your own. You really can't do anything on your own, much like a baby. And just like a baby, all you want to do is sleep. Because your brain is doing a whole bunch of re-wickering in the background, which is actually one of the things we study with some of the, the grasp experiments and some stuff for sensory deprivation. So it's pretty cool how your brain rewires itself and it takes effort and energy for it to do that. Um, but yeah, everyone, and then once you do adjust to sleeping, some people like to be bungeed in, some people like to free float. I don't, I mean, I know on the shuttle, different people did different things. Um, so that's kind of personal preference, but it's the best sleep I've had in my life. I have three young kids, so no one was waking me up in the middle of the night. I, but, so it was awesome. I didn't have any problems sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I found out I didn't need to sleep as much. Uh, it, I don't know, maybe it wasn't, it, we were really busy, but I, the, uh, I will go along with uh, what you're saying about you can really tell first-time flyers from folks that have flown more than once in the experience. Uh, I remember on you know, my last flight, Sergey Krikalov, who had been a year for a space, he was like, it was like poetry in motion, watching him move through the vehicle. And uh, on a previous flight, I had a newbie that uh, flew with us, and it was like they were bouncing off the walls the whole time, even after two weeks. They hadn't adapted to, uh, to zero G. The interesting thing is um, the physiological aspects that Raj was talking about, you know, you, it takes time to adapt to zero G and it's time to adapt to one G coming back. But with each flight, you learn, your brain remembers. And uh, I'll never forget my, you know, my second flight, once we got to zero G, it was like, hey, I'm here, I'm back. It, it's, it's amazing. So you adapt quicker each time to both zero G and one G with the number of flights. I, I never had any weird dreams, but uh, something that's really cool is, especially on a high inclination flight, you're, it's all dark and you're sleeping at night and all of a sudden one of these high energy particles hits your retina and you get this flash in your eye from, uh, yeah, so that's kind of cool, interesting. Cool, but also depressing, it's like that's my cordia getting bombarded by radiation. So, but it's, <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, Raja, Bob, thank you so much. That was, uh, those are very entertaining answers, so we appreciate it. Um, we have another one from Twitter for Dana. How has adding commercial partners changed the way NASA sends crew to the space station? 
Oh, that's a really good question. So um, by using these commercial partners, you know, I, I like to step back and think about commercial crew program has paved the way for NASA. We have partnerships um, all over the place. We work with our internet, uh, with our partners among NASA. We work with partners outside of NASA with um, com specifically Boeing and SpaceX, who we've selected to um, provide these crew transportation systems for our astronauts to be able to fly up to the International Space Station. And we also have partnerships with um, DOD um, and other entities, FAA as well. So we've kind of paved the way for NASA to be able to do um, a lot of this commercial um, work with the commercial industry. And what that's really done for us too is um, as we talk about all the science and the experiments and everything that we've, we're learning on the International Space Station, we're allowing NASA to also specialize and look at going beyond and all of the Artemis program and everything that Bob talked about as well. So it's, um, it's really cool that we're able to partner with these commercial entities providing this, um, this cost efficient uh, mechanism for us to be able to get our ast astronauts up to the International Space Station. It's, um, it's been, a, 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 been a, a fun trial, I think, for us at NASA. I think it's um, also paved the way for other um, programs that we've also mentioned, HLS and some others, that are also going the commercial route as well. So um, it's a different, it's a new paradigm for NASA to um, partner with these um, commercial industry, but it's allowing NASA to use our expertise and go further and go beyond to go to moon, Mars, and beyond. Absolutely, if I could add to that, Dana. So it, it allows NASA to actually focus on exploration because we're not paying so much getting back and forth to uh, the space station. Something else it's done is it's opened up commercial space. And uh, I think you're familiar with the uh, commercial LEO destinations program. Eventually the ISS is gonna end and we're going till 2030. So we got a lot of time left to keep sending crews up and doing science, but we wanna be able to transition to commercial space stations where we are one of many uh, customers and we're not paying for the whole thing again so we can focus that funding on the exploration part. Uh, along with that, uh, you've probably noticed the private astronaut missions. We flew one, we're getting ready to fly another. Uh, SpaceX has flown the Inspiration mission separate from uh, a NASA mission at all, not going to the International Space Station. And hopefully we'll have, you know, there are three companies right now looking at building a, uh, a commercial space station, much smaller, but we're learning utilizing the International Space Station on how we're gonna be able to transition in having private astronauts going to a uh, commercial destination also. So hugely important what we're doing right now on ISS to help enable that. I would I'd add one more thing too is, you know, the cool thing about this is um, because NASA is helping certify these transportation systems, it allows opportunities like any of you in the room too, to be able to go and fly in space. and. Um, these commercial systems that are being avail or that are available could be available for our kids, our grandkids, and any of you in the room here too. So I think it's a really cool opportunity to make space transportation available to everyone. Thank you, Dana and, and Bob. I'm glad that you actually mentioned that, that we're opening up space for everyone. Um, we have one from Jake on Twitter, and I'm not sure who he's directing this at, so uh, feel free to take that as you will. Can you take me with you? I need a few days off the earth. <laughs> so whoever would like to jump on that. <laughs> Sounds like Dana, since she just said they could fly on this space, right? <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I guess uh, take us take them with us. Um, yeah, if if the answer is like try to strap them into Crew Six, that might be tough to get on the manifest. But uh, just figuratively speaking, I guess uh, it's you know I think the the what struck me on the first uh, like the first few days um, is just the fun of being in the space capsule. So I. Uh, I actually enjoyed being in the Dragon for, I would have loved to be in there another day or two, because you've trained so much in it that it really becomes uh, like your like your home, like your room. It's a very comfortable place. It's kind of cool to hear the valves. Like when, before there's a burn, you'll hear the prop starting to flow. You can hear the valve cycle. You can see the plasma arcs out the front window. It's a, it was a very cool thing. I think the most surreal thing for us as a crew was we saw, uh, we picked up a tally on the space station about 40 kilometers. As we, I have, we happen to notice in the, in one of the displays that it should be out the window and it was 40 kilometers away, which you normally can't see on the ground, but it was backlit by the sun. And it looked like a like a golden Christmas ornament just hanging out there. It was so cool. Like that's that's where we're gonna go. Um, and then I think the next big thing is when you get onto the space station, it is visually overwhelming. It, 
it's not huge. If you had a house that big, you'd probably be unimpressed. You're like, that's not so cool. But in when you're in a capsule and then you go from the capsule to this house and you can use all four walls, that's what's really like mind boggling. It just is very visually and a very visceral emotion. Like, holy cow, like this is, this is enormous. And, and just trying to take that all in. Um, but just a sense of, yeah, I, this pure joy and, and all like Kayla wouldn't mind me sharing this, but she talks about at liftoff, just like a single tear of joy, like just the most unfiltered raw emotion of like, this is so, yeah, it's yeah hard to describe, but such an amazing thing. And then I think seeing the earth, yeah, I, people talk about the overview effect or whatever you want to call it, but there's, it's, yeah, I, I to Dana's point, I, I, in all seriousness, like, it'd be great. The more people that can go up there, the better, because you can, whatever you take away from that experience, it's, it's goodness, whether it's realizing there's no borders, whether you realize how fragile the earth is, there's so many conclusions, but having, seeing that, I mean, that's why we do human space flight. There's something you cannot do without your brain and, and seeing it and processing it. So I, I got to jump on that. When you talked about the joy, I wish I could take a five-year-old with me. Uh, you know, time on orbit is extremely expensive. It's very busy. And what I used to tell first time flyers is at some point during the mission, stick your nose up to the window and make a memory because it's so much better than anything. No picture does it justice. It's like going to the Grand Canyon. It looks awesome. And you take a picture and say, it didn't look like that. And it's the same with space. Even, even an IMAX film is not the same as, is what you see with the eyes God gave you. But, uh, it's, it's very expensive, but then there's time to have fun too and do stupid astronaut tricks. And you can be the best gymnast in the world in a, in a microgravity environment. And it's just, uh, it, there's, it's pretty cool. It's, it's a lot of it's fun. Really it's cool. a lot of hard work, but it's a lot of fun too. It's funny you said that. So we actually had that exact conversation with the Axiom One crew. So we were talking about private crews because they were taking a lot of pictures and we said the exact same thing, like put the camera down and just look, yeah. just look outside, just like, yeah. And you're yeah, just because you can't. And that cupola, they, it, yeah. I mean, these guys had that cupola, you know, uh, to be able to just sit in there and have all that looking out is yeah. pretty awesome. If I could, let me let me offer a different aspect of answering this question, too, because obviously we can't take everybody uh, along with us. It's, it's a very limited resources. But NASA is open about not only the imagery from yeah. flight, but our science, science data, too. So we have uh, open access citizen science initiatives uh, that are fueled by space station program data. Uh, Gene Lab, you may have heard, of, heard about, it's a repository of all of the genetic information, all the NASA investigations we've done on station. We have a physical science informatics database and they hold uh, both uh, grant competitions and also open citizen science applications to go in there and be part of this question. There is so much data to comb through that there are always discoveries that are out there that could be found. So if you don't think you can, can participate as a crew member, you can participate as a citizen scientist. Thank you all for those answers. That was, that was uh, some beautiful remarks there. Let's take it back to the room now. We have some hands going up again, right over here. Hi, thank you so much. I'm Masako. Um, first of all, today, this is so exciting and interesting. I'm so happy to be here and I'm, I have like so many questions. So I'm, I know I'm gonna regret that I'm gonna be able to, I'm not gonna be able to ask all of them, but um, I come from Space Tainment. It's a company that combines the word space and entertainment. We actually have an artwork that's going into ISS next month on a commercial flight. Uh, we're working with a space logistics company. So I appreciate your explaining how you're collaborating with new um, commercial um, elements to bring new things into space that wasn't conventionally done before. Um, because all of us at Space Tainment, we all want to go to space, and that's why we're doing this. But um, And our artists, of course, want to go to space, but we're sending in an artwork. It's a flat, small artwork as a symbolism to go into space instead of us. So um, we're really excited about bringing symbolism of exploring humanity by bringing it into space and looking at Earth and in a condition that's not you know, um, expected on Earth. So the story about how your dreams are different and everything, that was like really exciting because I feel like you learn so much about the human perspective by being in a very different condition. And I was curious if you had more um, 
things that you could tell us about how perspectives have changed. Like you talked about spatial perception changes, obviously, because you're in microgravity. How about like time or how you feel about things or like without smell and being able to eat the food that you're used to, even little things like that, I, I'm sure it changes perspective or even like how Jim has this amazing program with amateur radio that provides connection to earth that makes you keep um, being in touch. But I know you also have Twitter nowadays that so you could tweet from space. So that's really exciting to do. You, I don't know if you do Twitter space from space, but is there new experiments to stay connected and giving more information about the human condition in space to earth? Like maybe you're developing holograms or something being, you know, super Star Warsy and stuff like that. But I, want, I wanted to know if there's like new developments about that kind of aspects of humanity that you're developing that you could talk about. Sure. I can give an example that can probably kick it to Kurt uh, and Patrick was, I bet you they, they, there are definitely new developments. Like one we worked on was to you, the holographic thing you mentioned is what made me think of it, what, but like a virtual reality interface. And we were doing it from the perspective of like remote medicine. And so like talking to like a flight surgeon remotely, but it, the secondary use was like, you could have a virtual interface instead of like a zoom call with your family, which they, we set up, you know, once a week, you could do that maybe virtually so that that kind of connectedness is that better or worse or freaky or good. Um, uh, I think the, the other just general perspective is, uh, and the reason it takes so long to select astronauts is we spend a lot of time trying to find, uh, the right mix of people who can work together as a team. That's probably the biggest perspective change is you're, you're in this together. It's no different than, you know, small units in the military or deployed units or small teams where you really come to count on one another. And you're so your perspective, uh, you have to rely on a good connection with the ground and with each other. Um, so I think it's just good. Uh, you know, it's, it's a different, uh, world and not no pun intended, but you only are sharing that experience with the people there. And so you have to spend a lot of active time communicating with the ground, both professionally on, during the day, but also outside of the work day to make sure you're staying, staying connected. And I know there's, there's that, the virtual uh, piece, but there's, uh, I know other, other research of like, and as Kurt mentioned, all of it's open source, right? You can, you can go see all the experiments that have been done on that, on that connectedness are, are already out there. And it's actually, there's so much, I think that's, they would, take a long time to actually comb through to find what you're looking for, but it probably has already been done is my guess. So it, you make a great point. We've got a great searchable database out there. It's called the Space Station Research Explorer. You can go to it and you can search by keywords. You can search by the type of investigation you want to learn about. But you're right, Roger, that there has been uh, a number of investigations uh, in the field of behavioral science. And one of the results that came out recently was on astronaut time perception. So th that study actually showed that the, the time perception of crew members, uh, they think uh, a minute is a, a little longer than a minute actually is. And it, in retrospective, when they look back at uh, how long in the past something happened, it seems shorter to them. At least that's the reported results that we've seen. But uh, there is this entire field of behavioral science that we're looking at because we need to understand not only our crew cohesion for six month missions, but eventually how do we get to that Mars mission where it could be, you know, almost three years round trip. Um, it, it could be uh, a big, big part of that mission, just keeping the, the team together. Uh, other things that I, that I know we've looked into are uh, communication techniques guiding uh, operations for ultrasound or other medical procedures. And that has bearing not only for our crews in remote locations, but if you think about it for remotely isolated communities as well, where you don't have a specialist on call or the ability necessary to necessarily to even get to a hospital quickly. So uh, our, our Canadian partners are very interested in this for a lot of their Northern communities. I had a different perspective on your question on perspective. Um, so earlier this week, I was actually, I was lucky enough to go to, to Atlanta. There's a research team that's going to be launching an investigation from Emory University uh, on Northrop Grumman CRS-19 a little bit later on. Uh, but it was interesting because I had the chance to meet with this uh, investigator, the lead PI for this, about nine years ago, a, an outreach event over at Emory University where NASA and, and National Lab, we kind of go and we educate people on the opportunities that are available to leverage the space station. And she was one of 
maybe 10 people that was in the audience that day. And she came up to me afterwards and she said, hey, is there, are there like any research announcements that are geared towards uh, biological sciences or stem cell research? And I said, as a matter of fact, yeah, we have a, a research announcement available right now focused on stem cells. She applied and then she was awarded and she's flown multiple investigations. And so when I was meeting with her team this week, it was a great conversation because that nine years ago, her perspective changed on how it is that she could do science. Uh, she didn't realize, they didn't realize that they could leverage the space station and they could be part of something that is now uh, going to be forever etched in, in what it is that they do from a research perspective moving forward. So it was also a lot of fun just to kind of, you know, reminisce and be like, gosh, that was a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. But look at us now. And, uh, and again, it's exciting to go out there and, and share those types of stories on how, uh, you know, we are able to kind of change that perspective of what's possible in space and, and who can access it. Thank you all for uh, answering that question together. We have time for one more question here in the room. We've got a few hands up, so maybe we can take one. <laughs> I know, sorry, hard choice. We, maybe we'll take one here in the front that we haven't gotten to yet. Oh, one here in the front, sorry. We don't want to make you the bad guy. You're not choosing. Well, there you go. <laughs> Perfect. Hi, Shay Saldana here. Um, question for you. Can you go over the importance of plant-based research currently being conducted in space using systems such as veg veggie and X roots? That is a great question. So I'm going to try and do a really quick overview of all the different plant growing systems that we have on board right now. Uh, I mentioned the BRICS. Those are biological research and canisters. We, we put small plants in Petri dishes sometimes. Uh, we have a system called uh, Veggie. Veggie is uh, an expandable, collapsible um, container with lights to grow plants in. And we're doing a lot of our crop production research. Uh, in veggie to start off. Uh, we're trying to understand are, uh, they, are the fruits and vegetables as nutritional as earth-grown uh, varieties, and we're allowing the, the astronauts to sample those now, which is a great addition to their, to their diet. Um, but we also have X-roots. X-roots, or sorry, I should go back to uh, uh, veggie. In veggie, we grow the seeds or the seedlings of the plants in little pillows. Uh, so you can think of it as being typical growth medium. In X roots, which is also another plant growth chamber, that is specific, specifically for aeroponics and hydroponics. So there the root systems are growing in, in clear chambers and they're given uh, food medium uh, to grow. Uh, we're also looking at that for many different vegetable varieties and of course the, the nutritional value uh, in those. And then lastly, we've got a plant growth chamber on orbit called the plant habitat. And the plant, advanced plant habitat is really the, the mother load of plant research on ISS. In that chamber, you can control the atmosphere qualities, the carbon, di the carbon dioxide concentration, the light, exactly how much light it's getting, exactly how much uh, wind is on the crops, and really what we're getting at in that research facility is how are crops going to grow in maybe different environments on the moon or on Mars. Uh, we're really trying to understand the basis of those uh, crop systems in different areas. Thank you so much, Kurt. Well, that will wrap up the question and answer portion we have for today's panel. I want to thank our panelists for being here today and thank all of our social media content creators and influencers here in the room. It's always great to have the NASA social here at Kennedy Space Center. Uh, again, the liftoff of Cruise 6 is targeting very early Monday morning. That will be 1.45 a.m. Eastern time. We'll want you to turn in, tune into uh, the live coverage that will begin on Sunday night, February 27th at 10 15 p.m. Eastern time. You can watch that on uh, nasa.gov forward slash live or on our YouTube or any of our social media channels. Until next time, go NASA, go SpaceX, and go Crew 6. All right, and you have been listening to uh, live coverage. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, you've been listening to live coverage of the Crew 6 
uh, social media panel. Our own James Briarton was it was there to uh, actually get a question in, which is great. So we will uh, get to that um, a little bit later on uh, in, in next time. So uh, join us uh, on Sunday night as we're going to be live. We'll be live from NASA. So just just hit that QR code up here, and uh, you will be uh, just hit and then hit that notify me bell, and you're going to be ready to go. Uh, to watch us uh, as James is down there. We'll be on here. I'll be there. Uh, we'll have a kind of a rotating cast of folks starting at 10 PM on Sunday. So again, it's going to be kind of a late night, but if you want to spend a late night on a school night, spend it with us. It's a good play, a good way to do it. So, uh, but anyway, you know, it's a very exciting time uh, for another crude launch and a lot of really good questions in that panel from about Artemis and everything else. So, uh, so really good stuff there. Again, the replay will be here and we'll be playing some clips from this again tomorrow night. So again, hit that QR code live from, we'll be live from Florida, live from the Kennedy space center, uh, as we watch crew six dragon break the surly bonds of earth. It will be very exciting. Rocket launches are wonderful. So, so again, everybody, um, uh, for uh, James and the rest of Carolina Weather Group, I'm Jared Smith. Uh, thank you for watching our coverage of the Crew 6 social media Q&A. And we will see you back here on Sunday night to watch a launch. Take care, everybody.